When I think back on my history lessons at school, I mainly remember wars, colonialism, uh, revolutions, kings, presidents, and other people of power. So I remember history told on the basis of power, territory, struggle, and conflict. And that is, of course, one way to look at history. But what if we would remember the story of humankind, so our story, in a different way? One way to do this could be by telling history based on the evolution of human knowledge. Looking at history from that perspective seems to me a much more insightful story. It helped me at least to revisit old assumptions that I had about certain historical events. I started to think about this after reading several incredible interesting books and each one of them tells a part of the history of human knowledge. Additionally, most of these books are pretty provocative in what I have to say. For your convenience, you will find chapters in the comment section underneath this episode, so you can, if you like, jump right to the book that you are interested in. Welcome back to Bold Books and Bones. So what defines us humans more? War, power and struggle, or the knowledge that we have created throughout time? If you think about it, evolving as a human community on this earth or in a particular region depends so much on the knowledge that a community has and on what they do with that knowledge. Human knowledge has the potential, of course, for both good and evil. If knowledge is used with the intention to do good, it can, in most cases, nurture a sense of community, it create uh, political stability, it can help to ensure a future for a community, it can help to protect our planet, and so on. If knowledge is used in an exclusively self-serving or even destructive way, when facts are ignored or scientific findings dismissed, when lies are told by our political leaders and so on, our human communities ultimately will suffer from its consequences. Therefore, I like to think that the history of us humans could also be told and taught as an extraordinary story of the search for knowledge and the development and creation of new knowledge. Now, what would be essential in understanding human history in this way is that each time we humans develop new knowledge, our understanding of the world changes. When, for example, the evidence was undeniable that the Sun and not our little planet was the center of our solar system, our understanding of reality changed fundamentally. And there are, of course, thousands of examples of such fundamental shifts in how we understand reality. Let's start with going back in time when several thousands of years ago profound human knowledge was created. The first book that I like to share in this context is this thought-provoking book called The Darkening Age by Catherine Nixie. The information she shares start with some of the fundamental pieces of human knowledge that was created by Aristotle, Plato and other important thinkers. And in her book we immediately learn how fragile our human knowledge is. Because the author describes how this exceptional knowledge was almost totally wiped off the face of the earth by Christian extremists. We see how the so-called pagans had to flee for their lives because their knowledge, which would become much later the cradle of our scientific thinking, was discredited. And while many of these pagans emigrated from Alexandria to the Persian Empire, they brought a part of their manuscript collections with them. So this was one way in which their knowledge, or at least a part of it, was secured for future generations. The author Catherine Nixie tells this remarkable story and shows us an early version of a pattern of knowledge destruction by extremists. It is a pattern that will unfortunately repeat itself through time even in the 21st century. And almost every time this pattern is evoked by totalitarian rulers and or 
by extremist religious groups. The second book, called The Map of Knowledge, written by Violet Muller, is a perfect choice, I think, if you want to see what happens next with our ancient human knowledge after it was banned from Alexandria. The author, Violet Muller, does this in a highly original way. She chooses three important manuscripts who were created about 2000 years ago and she follows these ancient texts all the way to the 15th century. What I found most fascinating about her research is that she shows how knowledge travels to those places where there is openness and tolerance to new information coming from different cultural backgrounds and the Muslim world of Baghdad and Toledo were at that time such great and stimulating places for the creation and evolution of human knowledge. So in her book we travel from 300 BC to the 15th century and along the way we discover of course the highly intellectual culture of the Arab world in the 8th century and beyond. In Violent Muller's book called The Map of Knowledge we see how some knowledge that was initially written in Greek was translated into Arabic and we learn how knowledge was enhanced and how new and original knowledge was created in the Arab world. And finally, we learn how many of these manuscripts found their way to Europe and were translated into Latin. It was partly because of this ancient knowledge that could be found in these translated manuscripts that a new way of thinking started to emerge in Europe. If you want to discover more about Violet Muller's wonderful book called The Map of Knowledge, you can find a full episode about it on the Bold Books and Bones YouTube channel. Now, as I just mentioned, it was partly the revival of old knowledge that fueled the transition from the Middle Ages into the Renaissance. And this brings us to the next book about the evolution of human knowledge. It is this exceptional book by Stephen Greenblatt, which is called The Swerve. It describes in an incredible compelling way how the rediscovery of ancient manuscripts was instrumental to slowly unlock a new and fresh understanding of reality in the European part of the world. In this book, Stephen Greenblatt focuses on one particular manuscript that is called On the Nature of Things, written by Lucretius. It was a Roman poet who lived in the first century BCE. It was rediscovered in 1417 by a book hunter called Poggio Bracolini from Florence. And this man traveled on horseback across Europe in search for ancient Latin manuscripts. And he found this remarkable text in a monastery. In On the Nature of Things, written in the first century BCE, the author talks, among other things, about the existence of atoms, tiny particles, out of which everything is created. While reading this text, you wonder right away how people living more than 2000 years ago were able to formulate such insights without having access to our modern scientific instruments. To me, the author of The Swerve wrote a perfect history book. He brings us a history in an unexpected way. And with his approach, he shows us that history is not only about kings and battles. Additionally, he tells a story in a compelling way. So far with these books, The Darkening Age, The Map of Knowledge and The Swerve, we see how exceptional human knowledge in a particular part of the world was created, how it was attacked, how it traveled through the hands of many people from many different cultures, how this knowledge was enhanced, how new and original knowledge was created. We see how knowledge was partly destroyed, but we also learn how ultimately and almost by chance some fascinating and essential text, like On the Nature of Things, survived and were rediscovered. These books tell a part of our human history in a very cool way. Also, these books talk about old knowledge that was rediscovered and that started a new understanding of our reality. 
meaning that maybe the history of knowledge does not always follow a straight line, but has at least some detours and some discontinuations. If you want to know more about Stefan Greenblatt's book, you can find a full Bold Books and Bones episode about it here on this channel. Now, after I read these great books, I came across this next book, and it's called The Light Ages. The subtitle reads A Medieval Journey of Discovery, and it was written by Sepp Falk. The content of this book came as a surprise to me, and it fits perfectly in this series of books about human knowledge. Because I always thought that the medieval period was a time of stagnation when it comes to the development of scientific knowledge. I never questioned the idea of the so-called Dark Ages, where all people in Europe believed that the world was flat, where life in general was dominated by superstition and religious belief, and that we had to wait until the Renaissance before any scientific thinking would return to Europe. However, this book argues that the truth is much less black and white. The author Sepp Falk illustrates with plenty of well-researched examples that the development of scientific knowledge definitely made clear progress in these so-called dark times. One example of a field that continues to make progress was astronomy, and that is maybe not a real surprise. Because if we consider that people back then lived much more in contact with nature, they could see plenty of stars every night. And using them for navigation and other purposes was almost a given. That was, of course, long before there was light pollution by our big cities and we could still see at least a hundred times more stars at night than we do now. And it was, of course, before we had digital navigation instruments like GPS systems in our cars and on our smartphones. Now, what I found really great is that Sepp Falk talks in his book about one of the earliest predecessors of our current digital navigation system, and it is called the Astrolabe. And this is how an Astrolabe looks like. With this tool, you can even today accurately determine what time it is. It can tell you your location, what time the sun rises and sets, and about 99 other things. Although the Middle Ages were probably dominated by religious doctrine, Sepp Falk argues that this did not prevent some people to study the stars and try to understand their movements in the heavens. And this incredible instrument is a testimony of the in-depth mathematical knowledge that our ancestors had. It was originally developed in ancient Greece and was later further developed in the Arab world. And finally, it found its way into Europe. In the 14th century, Geoffrey Chaucer wrote a treatise on the astrolabe. And yes, it is the Geoffrey Chaucer that uh, some of us might know um, as the author of the famous Canterbury Tales. Geoffrey Chaucer wrote this manual on the astrolabe for his son Louis. And he based his text on an older text by a man called Masala ibn Atari. The much older 8th century manuscript by ibn Atari does unfortunately not exist anymore in the original Arab version. However, Chaucer had access to a later Latin translation of it. The astrolabe is a masterpiece of mathematical knowledge about the stars and it is a masterpiece of craftsmanship. Or as Sepp Falk would say, if you have an astrolabe in your hands and you understand how it works, you've got the universe in the palm of your hands. My knowledge about the astrolabe is not at that level yet, but because of reading about it in Sepp's Falk and other books, I learned what happened when you point your camera to the pole star and wait for a couple of hours. I tested my new insight during a recent trip with my wife to the beautiful village called Montolieu. It is one of the eight book villages in France. It is a beautiful place 
and I highly recommend it to all people who love books. Now, I waited until it became dark and I positioned my camera at the south side of the village while aiming my camera to the north at the Pole Star. And while I waited for several hours, the following images started to emerge. Because the Earth rotates, it seems as if the stars are moving in the sky. This is what our human ancestors could observe for thousands of years. And some of them transformed their observations into mathematical knowledge and could therefore create the astrolabe. The author Sepp Falk could not have chosen a better tangible proof of the scientific mindset of many scholars during the Middle Ages. The title, The Light Ages, is a slightly provocative title that very much covers the convincing content of the book. This book is another wonderful piece of the puzzle of how our human knowledge, in this case in the Western uh, European part of the world, evolved through time. And it is a convincing argument that the term Dark Ages does not accurately represent this period of time in history. I always like it when authors are able to provoke my way of thinking and let me reconsider old assumptions. And this is what this book definitely does. Because of Sepp Falk's book, this book caught my attention during my monthly book hunting trips to antiquarian bookstores in my neighborhood. It is a 1970s edition of a book that was first published in 1953 and it's called Robert Grossetest and the Origins of Experimental Science 1100 to 1700. This book is written by A.C. Comby and describes how Robert Grossetest, who lived in the 12th and 13th century, was one of the important founders of scientific thinking in Europe. So again, this was during the medieval period. I found both books truly fascinating. However, this book by Sepp Falk is told by a scholar who is also a great storyteller and therefore it's easy accessible to a wider audience. This book is also written by a scholar and I think that it was mainly written for scholars. I skipped all the sometimes half a page long footnotes and it took me a while to work through its content. However, I discovered fascinating information about the history of our human reasoning. Some of the things in this book made me better understand where our scientific way of thinking came from. And the closer look at its origins did not felt at all as a waste of time in this age where there is, at least online, a lot of confusion between scientific facts and personal opinions. Now, in a society that has a dominant and controlling government, Progress in knowledge is only allowed as long as it does not contradict the political or religious dogmas of its leaders. And that brings us to the next book of this episode. It is called Infinitesimals and was written by Amir Alexander. As strange as it might sound, this book tells the story of how a mathematical concept that states that a continuous line is made up of distinct and infinitely tiny parts was strongly opposed and even banned by religious and political groups in the 17th century. We learn how generations of mathematicians from the Jesuit order fought against the concept of infinitesimals because it contradicted with their worldview of the perfect order of nature. The author Amir Alexander brings many things together in a most interesting way. 
He shows us, for example, how church doctrine and political power can prevent or stimulate the growth of knowledge. We learn in this book about many great mathematicians, about the case of Galileo Galilei. We learn about the Jesuit order, about the Royal Society, about the political development in England and how all this also relates to the acceptance of or often violent opposition to a mathematical concept. Without spoiling the story, I can safely say that the concept of infinitesimals won after many battles the war. And this concept has helped to shape the modern world. This incredible interesting book is yet another example of how history can be told in a different way. If we put all these books together, we receive an insight of more than 2000 years of human knowledge creation. And in the case of these books, we only look at it from a Greek, Arabic and Western European perspective. And if we then would ask ourselves, how about our age? Is the development of our knowledge still evolving in the right direction? Is our human knowledge safe? And will it be accessible for future human generations? Then this book, with the alarming title, Burning the Books, Our Human Knowledge Under Attack, is to say the least a wake-up call to us, the current generation of humans on this planet. It is written by none other than Richard Ovenden, who is the current director of the famous Bodleian Library in Oxford. In this book he shows us how our human knowledge has always been fragile since the beginning of the creation of human knowledge. However, he warns us that there is a new and dangerous dynamic happening that undermines not only the essential conservation of knowledge, but even undermines the very essence of our democracies. This important book, published in 2020, can't be left out in this collection of books about the history of human knowledge. And if you want to know more about it, you can find a lengthy discussion about this book on this channel. And also a Bold Books and Bones podcast where I interview Richard Ovenden about his views and observations about our knowledge that is under attack. Now, to conclude, each time we humans create a breakthrough in the development of knowledge, we see the world around us in a new light and then a new understanding of reality, of ourselves and of nature in general is created and maybe here lays the essence of our human history. Or to say it with the words of Al-Nadim, the 10th century book dealer from Baghdad who wrote in his manuscript called The Fairest the following. Thus for the people of every time and age there is a new experience and a renewal of scholarship as foreordained by the stars of the zodiac which is the master of time's destiny and so on. Thank you for watching. Please share this episode with someone that might be interested and hope to see you soon at Bold Books and Bones on YouTube or on Instagram. In the meanwhile... Please stay curious and stay free. Bye for now.